Welcome to Decades of Horror, the classic era. I was confused. I couldn't decide what to do, and then I ate him. Oh, man. This is episode 135, recorded September 25th, 2022. Gruesome Magazine. I am your host, Jeff Moore, and on this podcast, we cover the good, the bad, and maybe even the ugly horror films released since the beginning of time, through 1969. In each episode, we'll discuss the monster, spirit, psychos. I always start going through into, like, William Shatner in this part, uh, and villains that have haunted movie-going audiences since the dawn of film history. Uh, Decades of Horror, the classic era, is also partnering with Play Now Media on three of their channels, the classic sci-fi movie channel, the classic horror movie channel, and the wicked horror TV channel. And uh, check those out. And again, those those are streaming channels you can uh, subscribe to for a fee, or you can watch them free, kind of like Tubi, or you have ads mixed in, but you won't get all of the premium content then. But at any rate, uh, apps on... Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV, Android TV, etc., etc., etc. All righty. With me this week are my incredible co ghosts. Uh, first up, uh, again, Whitney Chiazzo is not with us. She's uh, taken a couple months off, uh, taking advantage of a couple of opportunities. But with us today, we have a special guest host. Dirk Rogers. Dirk, how you doing? I'm great. How are you guys? I'm great. You want to tell uh, people a little bit about yourself? Um, I do makeup effects for a company presently uh, called K&B. Um, been with them for about 20 years. And uh, I started doing effects in the late, well, about 89, 90. And have jumped around from, from shop to shop over the years. And finally made K&B my home. Uh, right around the time we did uh, Land of the Dead. And that's about it. Uh, I also I also play in a grindcore band, which is a lot of screaming and is very fast. It's like if you threw nuts and bolts into a blender and put your fingers into and then hit record. That's what my band sounds like. Um, relaxing, relaxing. Very much so. Yeah, actually, yeah. It, it's yeah. Um, other than that, I that's about it. I like the way it says K and B. Like you may have heard of K and B. You yeah, may right, have heard right. of K and B. You, you might have heard of them in your travels. Which are the? Uh, <laughs> I worked for a Nick couple Taro of nerds. Burger, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. For, oh, uh, this is K and B. Yeah, K and B effects. You guys do a lot of stuff for The Walking Dead. And, uh, we do all the stuff creep for show. Walking Dead and the Creep Show. Uh, we just do the effects. We don't do the writing. Um, and all the Tarantino's films, um, he uh, locked on with those guys with Reservoir Dogs. Um, I, I joined up with doing his movies around Death Proof. And uh, yeah, we, we, we stay busy. Right now, we actually, we just finished up uh, Interview with a Vampire for AMC and the Mayfair Witches which uh, I could tell you are going to be very bloody. <laughs> well, <laughs> really bloody. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. That's about all I could tell you, but I can tell you it's going to be you really You know, bloody. it's one of those things where we keep talking about all these series coming up and you just, we just have no idea what it's, what it's going to be like. We'll check it out, but we're afraid. But anyway. Uh, and oh, just, I, I have no idea. I don't get to read the scripts. I had none of that stuff. Right. They just come to me and say, here's a guy who's going to get his face punched through make it so and then you guys spend and... days on something and that you get maybe a, a five seconds on screen at or, most you know, yeah so. exactly you spend a um, month making something and then it ends up getting covered in cg or yeah. cut down to two seconds but that's kind of the nature of the beast well i i still owe you dirk for that tour you gave me last last winter i'm still talking about that i was talking to uh doc and christopher more about it and, and they were like going we got to find a reason to go to la we got to find a reason to go to LA. <laughs> you guys should come for monster palooza let's set yeah. up a booth i've got some props exactly. i'll put them on the table we'll get people to come in we'll get the name out there yeah yeah come on out you can all stay on my couch <laughs> that sounds awesome <laughs> absolutely <laughs> yeah I, well anyway 
You could, yeah. So people, so people, he was gonna, he was, he was gonna say he spends half his time on there, on there. Yeah. On the anyway, <laughs> not many people he's, he's always in trouble. If I'm there, long-term uh, relationships. Uh, when, when is that? When is that? Uh, Son of Monster Palooza is in about two weeks, uh, and that's in Burbank. Okay. And then uh, Monster Palooza proper is, I'm gonna say in April, April oh, okay. or May okay. of next year. But um, the one that's happening in a couple of weeks in mid October, RoboCop reunion. Um, all of the Dream Warriors are going to be there. Uh, oh, wow. Phil Tippett is going to show up and talk oh about gosh. Mad God. Wow. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It sounds great. Nerd, 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 nerd. I'm going to be in the front row. <laughs> oh, That's that very would cool. be crazy. Very yeah. cool. Eli just told me about watching Mad God. He was thoroughly impressed my grandson that's uh i went and saw in the theater actually the opening weekend and uh Uh it's very ambitious it's very ambitious it's a little convoluted (laughs) in my opinion but wow but it's mesmerizing at the same time oh absolutely absolutely um okay we should probably do a podcast and so yeah (laughs) as, as we usually do uh our uh hosts get our guest host get to pick the movie and so dirk chose matango Matango. fungus of terror um (laughs) some of you may oh i didn't change the date got it why how could i how many times do i have to double check this 1963 would be the release year not 1959 um known in the u.s for a long time as attack of the mushroom people directed by ishiro honda uh writers takeshi kimura and from uh, an adaptation, Shinichi Hoshi and Masami Fukushima. From a story by William Hope Hodgson, The Voice in the Night. Um, also, uh, let's see, director of special effects. By now, he was the uh, company director of special effects. I'm going to let you take over the names here now if you want, uh, <laughs> Dirk. Okay. Uh, okay, so the director of special effects was Eiji Tsuburaya. Uh, many people would know him from Godzilla, Rodan, and a lot of the kaiju films of the Toho. Uh, the cast, uh, Akira Kubo, Kumi Mizuno, which many people would know from um, as the, the, the entire female species on Planet X with um, the <laughs> Godzilla vs. Uh, Ghidorah. Or, I'm sorry, uh, Invasion of the Astro Monster. Um, she has the little bob cut. She's amazing. Uh, Kenji Sahara, uh, Hiroshi Tachi, Tachikawa. Apologies for anyone that I screw their name up for. Uh, Yoshio Suchia, Hiroshi Koizume, and Miki Yashiro. Excellent. Thank you. Arigato. <laughs> So, um, how did I end up with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven? Yeah, that's right. There were seven key characters. All right. Yeah. Uh, and this is a picture of, uh, I'm going to just claim idiocy. I, I had a hard time keeping track of the names of the characters, but I could remember their, uh, sort of their, you know, what their job was or where they came from in life. This guy was the writer. Yeah. I that's a uh, mysteries or something like that. That's uh, Hiroshi uh, Tachikawa. Yes, yes. And he he was the first one to sample the mushrooms, right? Um, yes, actually he was. I think so. I think yeah. so. All right. Well, before we move on to uh first impressions, it's time for taglines with Chad. <laughs> oh boy, this should be good. <laughs> Perfect. I, I I felt like that was that was perfect. It reminded me of the mushrooms I singing. In the, in the jungle. I, I like that. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Chad. I'm, I'm disappointed. <laughs> what, what what were you expecting? I don't know. I just expect I expected it to just keep going on and on and on. Oh, like oh, 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 oh. <laughs> so, okay, folks. Taglines from Matango are as follows. Cast away on a forbidden planet, their craving for the strange exotic fruit drives them to madness and unspeakable horror. Cast away on a forbidden planet? 
We can't speak about it. The professor yeah, and yeah. Marianne. <laughs> I actually didn't see this anywhere, so it was that was what was in IMDb. So okay, I, I guess there's a strange exotic fruit, but I, yeah, Forbidden Planet. <laughs> hmm. Okay, all right. Second one, plant or animal, <laughs> or unknown terror, fear beyond belief. Well done, sir. We have we have unspeakable horror mm -hmm. and unbelievable fear and unknown terror. We just kind of up the creek, I guess. So. There's a lot of mystery surrounding this. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know. So plant animal. That has been taglines with Chad. <laughs> Yay! Okay. <laughs> I think I'm. I, this go. is my last episode of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Enough chatter, chattering around. Time chattering. for first impressions. Uh, chattering. Yeah. <laughs> Good one, and Daphne. It, it takes a minute or two. Yeah. We're gonna. We're it. gonna let. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was gonna play that that TV show theme song that's about Chad where they say uh, listen to my story about a man named Chad the poor mountaineer I, that's I not how it goes it was yeah. <laughs> oh really yeah yeah it's not Chad uh, oh, no okay. well dog, it's a good thing it's I didn't not. use it then all right uh, Dirk I'm sorry um, no, so when did you first see this and uh, what are your first impressions I first saw this, uh, man, I was probably 12 or 13 years old. I saw it on TV. Um, I was drawn to it because I knew that a lot of the same players were in Godzilla films, uh, which I'm a huge fan of. Um, later in life, I, I started seeking it out because I was a bit of a DVD collector and I wanted to see the uncut version my first impression was it was amazing. It was great. I love the, the damp atmosphere. I love the coloring. It reminded me a bit of like a Bava film. Um, I love the fact that there's a lot of cool body horror in it. Uh, the sets were amazing. The miniatures uh, were uh, incredible. Um, yeah, I, I would say it left a pretty lasting impression on me to where I sought it out later in life when DVDs became a thing. Cause I would have saw this in the era of VHS or just, you know, late night mm -hmm. mid, uh, million dollar movie. Um, once I, once I had, once I got the DVD and I saw the, the Japanese version with the, you know, the uh, subtitles and such, uh, I got so into the story that I actually started researching William Hope Hodgson got into everything that he was writing because I wanted to read voices in the night. And, and, um, and it just, it, I've always had a love of this movie. Um, I don't think it gets quite the, I think attack of the mushroom people is kind of uh, it. I don't want to say it, it dumbs it down, but it just makes it uh, just makes you think it's not going to be as suspenseful as I feel that it is or as well made because you kind of think it's just going to be, uh, you know, atomic age, cheap suits, bad acting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to me, this this was I feel that there's a bit of a lull in the middle. Uh, but I think that's also the the screenwriting. There's a couple of scenes that just don't make sense to me. I never had a problem when I was younger. But as I got older and I re especially this past week when I revisited it, I, I was mm -hmm. like, oh, I, I see a couple of flaws in the in the writing that I never saw before. But I, I just love this movie. Um it it was this or destroy all monsters when you asked me to pick one and i literally was arguing i love this so much and i love this one so much and yeah. <laughs> i just feel that everyone knows destroy all monsters and matongo doesn't get the love that it should because it's just such a solid film it's got such great atmosphere um so that's my first impression all right all right very cool i agree with all that um mr chad well Jeff. When did you first see this? Um, it, I, I know I, it helps you. Re it helps you remember back in the old days when you take your glasses. If I take off, my glasses off, it makes me look more mature, yeah. like I'm <laughs> contemplating very important things. 
Um, I saw this as a kid too, um, probably on TBS or one of those, it seems like. And I, back, it was probably one of my first exposures to like, like Dirk brought out to body horror and, and the, the, the grossness of like fungus and people turning into <laughs> fungus and growing fungus on their body. I mean, you know, that's, one of the grossest things ever, a fungal infection. Mm -hmm. I mean, have you seen Jeff's toenails? Yeah. I mean, so, no. <laughs> so, okay, I'll send you pictures. Thanks. Was, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I could use some reference photos. <laughs> Chad's, Chad's seen parts of me. Nobody knows about it. Well, it yeah, true. We'll, we'll, we'll tell that story after the, after the Dirk's show. doing a good job covering for the fact that he does know what, <laughs> what Jeff's doing. Yeah, that was a Freudian yeah. slip, I'm sure. That was weird. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, this 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 movie, I've, I've loved it since day one. I love uh, the build up. Uh, the creatures aren't in it for, for very long, but boy, when they you start to see them and see these things that people are turning into uh, it's it's just amazing the suits are amazing uh the set the sets are amazing especially uh the mushroom uh set where everything's mushrooms you can't tell who's where the humans are and where the where the uh, creatures are and the, it's just a, it's just an amazing film well acted well um thought out great story uh, one that I've seen, it reminds me a little bit of um, Leviathan. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, I see a, that. A bit, you know, yeah. and some, I always wonder, did they get, did they get Leviathan, get the idea for this, from this movie? So, yeah, it's it's a, one of Toho's best movies, I think. And um, so, and uh, it still holds up very well uh, now. So, yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Thank you, Chad. Daphne, what did you think of this movie? Well, first, I don't have my glasses with me, but it, it helps me remember when I push them up onto the bridge of my nose. Yeah. That's usually when it's best. Here. Even when they're not yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Is that better? <laughs> well, much better. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, I I saw this. I didn't see it as a, as a kid like you guys did. I saw it probably... I don't know, maybe five or six years ago. Um, I'd definitely heard of it before. And I think I only heard a bit about it as the attack of the mushroom people. Um, but um, when I first saw it, I just, I loved it. I was totally blown away with um, the color and the, just the texture of the mushroom stuff. And, and uh and that's mostly what I remember. And so when we we're talking about watching it again, I was I was really excited because I remember I had such a really strong reaction to it. Um, and then when I watched it again, um, I was kind of surprised about that it, it, the color is wasn't as vivid as I remember it being, but it was definitely there, especially on the ship. And um, so at first I was kind of like, Mm, why did you know kind of what's what was on my what was going on with my memory that I remembered it so so a little bit differently and um the more I thought about it the more I it's like stuck with me and I've been thinking I, it just made me love it again like the last couple days I've just been really thinking about it and um and I'm excited to talk about it but I remember mm -hmm. the first time I I just know that when I saw it I just was blown away by it I just loved every second of it. <laughs> Why? Well, and I think there's a lot of depth that isn't obvious. Um, yeah. It just that. kind of sits with you and then it kind of. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, especially as a kid. But having mm -hmm. said that, I did not see this as a kid and I'm, I'm going to blame it on Iowa. Uh, <laughs> I don't, I really do not remember uh, the Toho movies coming around at all to the theaters in the sixties. And if they did, I might've skipped them, but I don't remember any, you know, talking about them in school or any of that stuff. So, um, I just you led a I, sheltered life. I did. I did. Uh, but what, well, and my background is mostly in universal horror, the old, the classic horror stuff, which is why I like this podcast so much. And, uh, 
AIP, AIP, all the AIP stuff came around because one of those guys, uh, uh, Nichols and uh, Nicholson and, and Arkoff, Arkoff from Iowa. One of those guys. Oh, yeah. The so, reason uh, this is called Attack of the Mushroom People is because AIP picked it up and changed the name from yeah, the Tongo. I, and I just, I don't, it might have come to the drive in at that time. I didn't, I wasn't going to drive in. I was too young. I don't know. Um, anyway, so, uh, this is very cool. And I always heard of it as Attack of the Mushroom People. And I'm going to agree with what Dirk was saying because it sounds kind of hokey, you know? It, it, mm -hmm. at, at least I, I love how it sounds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, Matango, Fungus of Terror. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, uh, how do we, how do we market this, boys? Matango. <laughs> What's a well, matango? I, I, <laughs> it sounds like a dance. My sister does. <laughs> that's a, I think that's a Dean Martin song. Mambo Italian. Oh no, that's Mambo Italian. Um, so anyway, uh, we do D here like, at Poh. Yes, we do. Damn straight. My my train of thought is is uh, off the rails. I who look a rabbit like hole. <laughs> I like this a lot um, for the concept, the progression, the uh, especially after seeing how they did a lot of this stuff, because there was there were some shots I looked at and went, well, that's, you know, but it's kind of still kind of cool to see how they did it. Um, the uh, creatures, the Matangos are just creepy as all get out. I think, and I fungus is like one of the, you know, yeah. That's why the what is, what is uh, what's the one in Creep Show that Jody Verrill? That's why that yeah. one's creepy. Yep, yep. Or the blob is even somewhat like that, <laughs> although it's not it's not it's not uh, fungus or moss or anything. But anyway, and I went and read that story too. I had read some William Hope Hodgson before, but I don't think I ever read that story. So I hmm. I read it when we did this, uh, and I it's that's interesting as well so uh they took it the next step but it, the thing that's cool to me is how it kind of relates to and honda's done this quite a bit starting with godzilla the connection to the uh the atomic bombs dropped mm -hmm. in hiroshima and nagasaki and there's lots of visuals here that could bring that back you know and and how that affected their lives so um i'm going to quit talking because i know you guys are going to have a lot more stuff to say about this than me um yeah <laughs> you know i listened oh, to you on this other podcast daphne and i'm like i gotta start shutting up because it she I, how do stop. i get her to talk that much on this <laughs> she, stop it that's obvious isn't it all right um all right so some posters that's actually i don't know if that's a poster or at rather a vhs box maybe I think it's VHS. Um, tack of the mushroom people. Yay. Uh, and that shot never takes place in the movie. No. Those seven people are never together cringing mm -hmm. from the creatures at once like that. Um, I like this a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's got, it's those one of those great Japanese, uh, I don't know if you mm -hmm. call that a collage or what, but kind of an pieces of the movie yeah the you are right on about the funk i mean it is so gross just the idea of the all that fungus and all that moisture and everything just, ooh. Ooh, ugh. <laughs> just looking at that is just oy, oy, oy. It, i love it it's so gross <laughs> It's so cringe gross. I love the it. soggy I love wet that. sounding footsteps i know yeah, yeah. <laughs> And mm -hmm. here's a couple that use the same, they use uh -huh. that blue and green, I don't know, version of it. One's Matango, one's mm -hmm. Japanese title. And another mm -hmm. one. Ooh, that's she, a cool one. She's just, just a girl in her mushrooms. Yeah. So, yeah. It's a Friday night. Yeah. <laughs> I really I liked this movie. scene. I'm glad that there's a poster of it yeah. because... Um, that's, for me, that's like when it kind of started, you really could tell that it was good and dark. Like there was something something more going on mm -hmm. <laughs> about yeah. these what's happening to these people. Um, I thought, well, I thought she did she, great. 
Yeah, when she wore the the green scarf and the green dress too, sort of like that was when she started being mm -hmm. taken over mm -hmm. by the. It, I like that, the, mm -hmm. and I like that yeah. she's the only one that gets more beautiful after she eats. Mm -hmm. Honda originally, they when they first started to do makeup on her and do test mm -hmm. makeups. Honda said, why are you guys trying to make her so ugly? She's such a beautiful girl. I, I think she was 26 at the time she shot this. And so he said, what I'd like to see is that she gets more beautiful, more alluring so that she can lure. She's basically like Matongo in that she's luring you in to try something you shouldn't. Yeah. And um, I, I totally got that. He succeeded in that because I, I just was like, why is she, why is it not happening to her? What's going on? It's, she is more like the voice for this. She's like totally become the this, seduction. This, yeah. Yeah. yeah sort of and the siren it just, for this. yes. Yeah. Yes. And um, it, it was just, I don't know. I really, really liked that. And, and that scene, especially it just, you get sucked in and how she's kind of looks a little bit like she's a little bit of um, darkness under her eyes, but she still mm -hmm. looks beautiful and um, she would have reeled me in for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. She uh, in that last scene that she's actually in, if you notice, her arm and her leg have started to turn green and have yes. some really rough. Yeah. So yeah. she mm -hmm. is starting to succumb to it. It's mm -hmm. but it's interesting that she's starting to succumb to it when they're now down to the very last survivor. It's mm -hmm. it's it's like the mushroom is finally letting its true face be seen. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, it's almost like a hive mind in a way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and this, I don't know Ooh. where this comes from. It's cool. I yeah. thought maybe it was fan art or something, but I, I don't see any artist signature on there or anything. Mm. Uh, mm. And it's got both the Japanese and Matongo and Attack of the Mushrooms all on there. It almost looks like a uh, like a band flyer, like for a gig. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just the yeah. way it's set up in the collage, it has a very '80s punk rock kind of vibe to it. But it, I it also, also still has I the also, uh, Toho symbol down there in the bottom. I'm yeah, sorry, yeah. Daphne. Oh no, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, it does. I was just thinking this. See, this makes me think of um, like Nakasaki and Hiroshima. Just I don't know. Maybe it's all the the red or the, I I don't know. This is like almost looks this like is really intense. Them, right? yeah. Um, yeah. This is that's really cool. And then we have to see. The Italian movies where the same woman is in every Italian poster. <laughs> what are all these white people doing yes, in here? I don't yeah. know. <laughs> That's oh, a great poster. I, I do declare I'm being taken away by a giant mushroom man. Yeah. And who are the two people down at the other one? Who are these people? <laughs> I don't know. They're going white. <laughs> hilarious. Yeah. And there's the same red dress. Once, once, you, yeah. once you pay and go in the door, we got you. So yeah, yeah. I guess. But it's it like, is, I swear. <laughs> the uh, the, the <laughs> top poster, the Matongo El Mostro, uh, yeah. reminds me a bit of the Swamp Thing movie poster ah. with Adrian Barbeau yeah. kind of hanging yeah. out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the same family, I guess. Well, what this did we lady, just do? That... This lady must have made a lot of money modeling for all these. Uh... <laughs> posters in the 60s because it's the same pose the same uh the, state uh, of undress the female version of fabio and the, the, <laughs> the romance covers yeah and yeah. at what point was a, she carried out by matongo i don't that's never that's happened. No, no, <laughs> scene, yeah, nobody carried. none of this none of that happened no, that edited happened. for television <laughs> so yeah. funny so just to do kind of a roundup here and we we uh we start off, we see these uh, people on this yacht. There's seven of them. And they kind of, they, you know, they have a little couple scenes there where you, you get to know who they are a little bit. Uh, and again, this scene does not take place in the movie. Uh, this <laughs> must be a promo shot they did. But I used it just so we could see who they were. So they, and these are what I call them. Uh, the rich guy is the guy who owned the yacht and the, with the white uh, captain's hat on and white shirt. Uh, that is uh, Hiroshi Koizumi. Um, uh, and he played... I actually, wrong? I think that's uh, Yoshio Tsuchiya because the the rich guy who's the owner. I, yes, you're right. You're yeah, right. Yoshio, sorry. forgive my, my American enunciation, Tsuchiya. Yoshio Tsuchiya. That, uh, that guy was, man, he's done a lot. 
yeah. Seven Samurai, Yohimbo. Oh. And the woman crouched down uh, beneath him was the one we saw in the in the green uh, scarf. Um, and that yeah. is uh, Kumi Matsuno. Yeah, Kumi Matsuno, uh, who plays Mommy the Singer. Yeah. She <laughs> is a Toho star. favorite. If you're a fan of kaiju films, Ibera, yeah. Gorath, yeah. War of the Gargantuas, Invasion of the Astro Monster, Frankenstein Conquers the World. And then she actually came back in, in the 2000s when they did the Millennia Godzilla series. She's in Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla. She, and she's in Final Wars, which came out in 2004. Oh, awesome. Yeah. She also said that this was her favorite kaiju film or uh, tokusatsu film that she did, you know, wow. uh, Very cool. out of all of those. And she did. Well, some... she has a big part. She has a key part in this. Yeah. 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 Um, I heard that a lot of the actors actually had said that the ones that had actually worked in kaiju films prior to this one said that the, one of the reasons they really liked this is because they were actually acting with the creatures instead of just looking up and, mm -hmm. and never oh, being oh. in the same shot with them. Yeah. And they yeah, said yeah. that that elicited a, a much stronger response when, when they were acting opposite, you know, the guy with all the stuff on his face and whatnot. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, the dressing on the sets was incredible. We'll, we'll show some pictures of that later, but yeah. the, uh, the moss and fungus amazing. and whatever, all that, everything. That's amazing. Um, okay. So then, uh, the next, uh, going to the right, the uh, man there is the psychology professor, which is Akiro Kubo. Kubo. Mm -hmm. Kubo. Uh, he uh, is has almost no sense of humor and is very serious <laughs> throughout the whole movie. That's not entirely true, but uh, he also lives to the end, so maybe he's got something yes, smart going for him. <laughs> he does. He does. He's the the final. Uh, and the uh, woman with him is one of his students, I believe, Miki Yoshiro. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, and she's very meek and mild until the very end. Yeah. yeah. It seems to me like she just mm -hmm. sort of is just kind of uncomfortable being around these people. And I can see that. She's a student and you got uh, these other characters. All right. Uh, next one over with the black cap and the gun is the captain or the skipper. Mm -hmm. And that's the one I said before, uh, Hiroshi Koizumi. And next over is the deckhand, Kenji Sahara. Yeah. And uh, he's awesome. <laughs> Kenji Sahara um, is an amazing actor. Yeah. Um, and he's in a bunch of Toho stuff, isn't he? He plays June that. in Ultra Q. Uh, if you're a fan of like Ultraman in the very first series. Oh. He, huge role in that i mean he's kenji sahara has the distinction of actually debut being in the debut of rodan godzilla and king Ghidorah. he's one of the only actors to be in all three films wow. of their wow. first oh, okay okay this guy is so committed that there was talk that you know they asked him to take his tooth out uh i did a little research on that and he was already missing a tooth from service in world war ii <laughs> yeah. and he just took the tooth out but oh. this this guy's resume <laughs> Oh my God! Godzilla, yeah. Rodan, the Mysterians, the H Man, Mothra, Gorath, King Kong vs. Godzilla, Atragon, Mothra vs. Godzilla, Ghidorah, Frankenstein conquers the world, War of the Gargantuas, Son of Godzilla, <laughs> Destroy All Monsters, Space Amoeba, Godzilla vs. Mecha Godzilla, Terror of Mecha Godzilla. Then wow. we go into the then we go into the nineties, and we've got. Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah in 91. We've got Godzilla vs. Mecha Godzilla Part 2, Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla. And then along with uh, Kumi Mizuno, he shows up in Final Wars. Um, mm. The guy is amazing. Uh, he's been in every one of the favorite films of my youth. So I love him. <laughs> oh, so, well, I guess he's, is he, he's still alive. At least they don't have a. I uh, believe he actually came to it. Monster Palooza. We were talking a bit earlier about Monster Palooza. He had actually come to. Um, oh, well. Let me think here. COVID, two years. All right, it was probably about five or six years ago, but he showed up for a War of the Gargantuas with uh, Russ Tamblin. Um, oh. <laughs> and they did a whole... He he was definitely feeling looking a little long in the tooth, shall we say, but he was still pretty with it and uh, really appreciative of all the American uh, tokusatsu yeah. fans, kaiju fans. Well, he'd, be, he'd be 90 now if, his, if the birth date is correct. Wow. Well, I hope I hope he lives to a hundred. Yeah. Yeah. He was awesome in this uh, movie, that's for sure. Sure was. Sure was. Yeah, he was. He was he was a kind of a standout character. He was really sort of <laughs> running the show. He was he was like the guy in an American war movies, the the serviceman who's 
always making deals <clears> and <throat> black market stuff and hitting people against each other and, and that kind absolutely of stuff. Um, yeah but he didn't you didn't realize that until a little bit later and then all of no, a sudden it was right. like yeah <laughs> wait a minute you, you sold those turtle eggs to that other guy. Yeah. As soon as you as you saw him, I as soon as you saw him down there with he finding the food, I was like, ah, yeah, uh-huh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's <laughs> <have> the... <laughs> 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 uh, I found the spam. Uh-huh. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then the the uh, person kneeling down in front of him is the uh, writer, mm-hmm. Roshi mm-hmm. Tachikawa. Gilligan. And uh, he was he was also good. Um, yeah, yeah. But I, and uh, you know the cast is all good. I think mm-hmm. you know, yeah, and they, yeah, very solid. They mm-hmm. the writing differentiates their characters. I think you know, and the, the way they react to things uh, very quick. Time. And I've al- I've always only seen this dubbed. I've never seen it in the original yeah. Japanese, which I'm sure is a lot better than because well, you lose a lot in the dubbing. Yeah, uh, a lot of the nuances of the acting and everything, and that. Well, and I, I, you guys tell me. Uh, I felt like the dubbing, the dubbing was good, but I yeah. also felt like they were, you know, they arranged the, uh, the the dialogue to to fit their mouths as best they could. So yeah. I didn't yeah. feel yeah. like I. It makes me wonder what the if we got the whole story right. You know, like Dirk mm-hmm. was talking about. It seemed like there's some. It just yeah. seemed like there was a couple scenes missing or a couple quick jumps where you kind of go, wait, how'd they get from there to there? You know? Yeah. The scene I'm specifically talking about is where the guy who looks like he has noses all over him or just bumps when he first mm-hmm. it shows up on the ship and everyone's taking turns hearing him walking around. And then at one point he opens the door where they're all mm-hmm. at and then it just kind of fades away. And they're like, yeah, mm-hmm. what happened? Where did, did he turn and walk out? Or right. that was my only real issue with it. Mm-hmm. Um, with the story or the writing was that that scene to me didn't make sense. I watched it in Japanese uh, and in English to see if there was any difference. I didn't really, okay. they, their argument in English is the same in Japanese. Oh. Somebody says, you know, you didn't really see it. And everyone else is saying, yeah, we did. Uh, so I, I, I'm not sure why that the guy just suddenly disappears. Well, well let's talk about that. Cause they, hmm. they make him out to be kind of a ghost or something. Yeah, because he actually he actually fades away. It was an intentional effect, right? So, well, see, I wasn't sure if he was fading or if that was just a dissolve cut. Um, Mm -hmm. I I wasn't sure if it was intentionally that he was. Did he come through the door and then kind of poof, go corporal, or Mm -hmm. was it just? I I I don't know. That was my only. That was my only trepidation story. Maybe it was it one might. of those mushrooms that you kick and it just puffs into yeah. spores. There's spores tons of spores. Right, right. Well, I, I was, my, I was uh, uh, listening to an interview. Star Trek. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> I was listening to an interview with Akira Kubo, and he was saying that at the end, there was discussion whether or not he had eaten the mushroom. And uh, Honda had said, actually, some of these mushrooms, the spores get into the air. There's a scene where they go into the captain's room and you see everything floating through the air. Mm-hmm. And uh, Honda was saying, so Chad, to what you were saying about when they kick it, the spores go everywhere. Maybe that is actually what mm-hmm. happened is, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know. Maybe he disappeared and filled yeah. the air with spores. Well, I in my... I'm reaching. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. So wherever <laughs> I in my, oh, go ahead, Dan. I was just going to say that is a shame though, because there was the buildup to that creature's arrival was so good. And, oh, yeah. And then just all of a sudden, you know, yeah, and it just it disappears. disappears. It's like, yeah. And if it would have been like a spore thing, I mean, God, how creepy is that? Not only are mm-hmm. they in moist, and now there were spores that were, t- <laughs> were sucking, you know. And so I, I agree. That part was a little bit like, I was like, what, what happened? Um, all he wanted was a cup of sugar. That's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, in my, in my errant, yeah. <laughs> in my errant youth, I worked for a guy for about three months where I harvested uh, psilocybin mushrooms. Oh and wow! You I, what a fun I didn't guy. Work, I, yeah, I didn't a fun guy. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> try the I soup. Was, it's mushroom I, flavor. Uh, <laughs> but I didn't I didn't wear gloves when I did it and you got kind of a contact high after a period of time you know sort of a low grade uh, 
speed or something. So anyway, and this is this is a long time ago. Statues of limitations. No one with every guess <laughs> that knows me would know who I was wow. working for or anything. Uh, but um, yeah, I so I that crossed my mind too that they weren't getting some of some. You know, I mean. Are you That's on what I took it all the way along. <laughs> all the way along, I kept thinking these are these are magic mushrooms, and they're going to start hallucinating or something, you know. Mm-hmm. And it kind of fit that, you know. You hear those, well, weird they do laughing and crying things, yeah. and uh, when they well, um, two things. Uh, first, they do hallucinate because when uh, the one guy does eat it, the rich guy, when Kumi Mizuma comes and gets him after she's transformed. And he eats it. You see all the dancing girls mm-hmm. and you see the visions of Tokyo skyline and that one oh. girl that like flips mm-hmm. over and does the mm-hmm. bend back bend. So they do kind of. And even when um, I want to see who's the other person that you see eat. I think it's the the student. I think when she starts to eat it, she kind of gets a little uh, you kind of yeah, see it in yeah. their faces. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, and don't well, they, they definitely... kind of talk a little bit about how they don't care anymore or they're just going to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they feel so much better. I'm better, not yeah. Anymore, blah blah blah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's kind of like the mushroom, the cordyceps. You know, the ones that go into the bugs' brains and then mm-hmm. make them climb to the top of the hill. It's kind of like that. It's it's making you numb to your surroundings, mm-hmm. numb to your pain and your hunger, mm-hmm. so you can kind of become a vehicle for the further propagation of the the right, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because the one said, "I'm not hungry anymore. I'm not right. hungry." Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's so much thing, so much to think about in with this movie afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Agreed. I mean, well, that go kind on, of stuff, uh, also like addiction and just yeah, there's just or a even lot just the there. the breakdown of societal norms. Yeah. Uh, I mean, mm-hmm. it's basically uh-huh. like Lord of the Flies, exactly. You know, with a stereotype of each of the, mm-hmm. the Japanese um, of, of that era. You know, the one rich right. guy, the one mm-hmm. you know, the, the mistress. And all that. Yeah, I, I actually mm-hmm. was thinking about that. That. I didn't go back and pair them, but there's a lot of characters similar to the ones in Goki Body Snatcher from Hell. Yeah. Oh, I thought that too. Yeah. There's the rich guy. I didn't even the think writer, about that. You're right. The, yeah. Uh, psychology. Mm-hmm. And the color scheme is very similar mm-hmm. too. It's, you know, it's very uh, garish. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Again, I go back to reminding me a lot of Bava films. Yeah. Yeah. So Dirk, Dirk uh, brought in a whole bunch of uh, pieces of information here. And so we're going to. We're going to go through these. Hopefully, you guys will enjoy this. Um, and I apologize to the people that are on sound that are just here in the audio podcast. Maybe this would be a good time to go check us out on YouTube. Yep. But this first one was what, uh, Dirk? A concept art on the top? That's that, a yeah. That's a concept art. Um, let me see if I have the. And they really look like it looks like a mushroom cloud. Yeah, yeah it does. So good. Uh, well, I think that. I mean, it's obvious with Godzilla, but Ishiro Honda's um, uh, the effects that World War II had, especially Hiroshima and Nagasaki, mm-hmm. had on his output after World War II. Everything has a message. Every one of his films at the end has some type of message. And even definitely this looks like the mushroom cloud, but to the fact that when they go to the ship and they find out that it was a research vessel and it was researching the effects of radiation... I, on these different yeah 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 you yeah. can just see that it it affected the man in a in like soul changing you know uh either what he saw or you know just mm-hmm. just being a part of that era uh that it influenced everything he did so as you can see with the art you know i i'm not sure if they brought this to him or if he just okayed this you know i want to see something mm-hmm. that looks like a mushroom cloud in it mm-hmm. uh but yeah it's gorgeous so the, uh Go ahead. The the yeah the picture at the bottom is uh, tell us about that, uh, Dirk. Because that's all very right. Interesting. <clears throat> let me pull out. Let me go to my computer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, Eiji Subaraya, uh, in charge of the effects, uh, he got wind or had seen that uh, there was an optical printer called the Oxberry Twelve Hundred. And what an optical printer basically does is allows you to it, you can do simple things like dissolves and and, um, and uh, fades and things like that. But more importantly, the Oxberry allowed you to do up to five or six different layers. So you could put your miniature in, you could put your ocean in, people running, 
smoke, everything else. The only person at the time or the only company at the, at the time uh, that had this was Disney. When Subaraya saw it, he went to Toho and said, I need this. I need this immediately. So they spent $700,000 to get this there, which was unheard of at the time. Um, and that's a shot. That's a shot of it. what you're basically looking at is a projector and a camera and then a projector and a camera and a projector and a camera. So you're, it's just going all the way through until the final one is the culmination you're of just, all the shots. Just adding Friday. layers at each stage. Correct. Uh, Correct. New film. That's yeah. so cool. Boy, and you got to have that all uh, synced and positioned exactly right. Absolutely. Absolutely. The other, not just this, but the other thing that was developed for this film or used for the first time in this film is the frontal projection. Uh, mm. Normally they had done, done a lot, you know, your traditional back projection, you see people driving and the, and the stuff's moving mm -hmm. behind them and they're doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, they decided to try some frontal projection. They used a screen made of scotch light, which is uh, the material that you would see, um, you know, crossing guards wear it, uh, safety tape, things like that. It reflects the light back brighter up to seven times brighter than it would normally be uh, mm -hmm. and it allowed for a much more crisp and clean shot of the um of the ocean scene where when they're all out on the yacht in the opening scene everything all of that was done uh, in studio with the exception of the miniature being filmed of the yacht out on the actual ocean mm -hmm. so uh, well that just that was really good because I, I i like the scenes in the, when they were in the yacht that looks great I did too. There, yeah. I, it was very realistic. Yeah. 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 Well, I appreciate it, and I, uh, I appreciate you bringing that in and explaining it. Yeah. I've heard of optical printers before, and I never, never quite pictured it in my mind. You know, I sort of understood what they were doing, but uh, that's I can that I can get. I, I wish I could just say I pulled that out of my head, but uh, I actually, I had to look it up too. I just make rubber monsters. Sure, sure. So all this stuff was all new to me too. <laughs> uh, one other thing though, about the uh, the set with the, the boat in the beginning, one of the first, this was one of the first times during the storm when they're on the deck and they're fighting against the water splashing up. Uh, I was listening to an interview with Akira Kubo uh, and he was saying that this was one of the first times that Toho had actually, they set the ship in the middle of the set and then they filled these giant drums full of water and they would just tip the drums over and the drums would rush to the ship, hit the ground and splash up. And that's basically how they wow. achieved all of the water, uh, which well, he yeah. said was really difficult to work against, mm -hmm. you know, because, well, I mean, you know, when they were showing the storm out in the ocean, I, I remember mm -hmm. thinking that looks like a miniature, but I don't get how did they get the water to look like that? Mm -hmm. You know, there was, it's something about it looked like it was a miniature or slowed down a little bit, but the water was foamy like it would have been on full scale. I was I was you're, you're talking about when it's just it does that full shot of the ship going out in the storm yeah, or when they're yeah. OK. Yeah, that was a miniature, but that was like a larger than normal miniature. Yeah. I, I want to say the boat was like 12 feet long. Yeah, know, instead and of we've got being, you've, you know, dinky, you've dinky. brought a picture of that. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, Pull some of these up. Oh, this there was you go. in the uh, studio, mm -hmm. right? The full yeah, scale the, uh, the the set behind the top photo, the screen. That's all the scotch light that they did the frontal projection onto. And but the only thing that made that uh, seem irregular was the rocking of the boat was too uh, too regular. It was like that's... exactly the same over and over. Yeah, again. that's uh, that's humans in the back going like this, right? <laughs> uh and then uh, this would be part of what you're talking about the, the picture exactly. at the bottom is what it looks like in the movie mm -hmm. that looks great it really does yeah it blends really well the film stock everything mm -hmm. it just it yeah. looks like you're there and then finally this is the uh, model ah. you were talking about that's yeah uh, like 12 feet there on the top or yeah, that they actually filmed out on the uh, ocean. I'm going to guess because of all the the storm, they probably had wind machines and such out there. Uh, and at one point, the boat kind of turns against the storm. And so I'm guessing they probably had some tow lines, but uh, I couldn't find any info on that. Yeah, yeah. And then the shot on the bottom is the uh, wrecked research ship that we were talking about, I guess. That, mm -hmm. that is awesome, um, too. It's gorgeous. Really? Look at the detail. I yeah. know you can just feel, you know, it, it's mm -hmm. yeah, it's great. It looks fungusy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it very, does. Fungus, very it moist. Certainly does. 
Yeah, it looks fungusy. Yes, the whole film has an era of moisture. Moisture. Yeah. <laughs> it is. I'm telling you. Yeah. Squ squishy footsteps will scare you every time. I, oh yeah. Gross. Uh, oh yeah. It's right out of. Well, that's another one out of uh, Creep Show. Creep Show. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the... I could hold my breath. Yeah. <laughs> a long <Awesome>. time. <laughs> With you. That's what this movie needed, Leslie Nielsen. Oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Was puddles of water villain. where you're standing. Yeah. Inside, yeah. All right. So here, now you were talking about putting the smoke or the fog in with the optical printer. I. This is this was well, there, right? In the yeah, studio. that's that's physically there because the actors are there. Um, right. But I'm the I think the fog would be more for when they're doing the miniatures, like when they come across yeah, the okay. research vehicle and you're seeing the fog and, and everything. Uh, one thing I will say about the the uh, air effects or what have you, um, they used <laughs> they used uh, rubber cement to make all the fungus in like the captain's room. And when I was listening to the effects artist talk about it, he said the way we got the spores to be in the air was just to dilute the rubber cement with acetone uh, until it was so thin that it floated. And then we would just blow it through the fan. Wow. That sounds really bad. Yeah, <laughs> it does. <laughs> and of course, none of that would ever go. Into oh, no, we have a thing called OSHA <laughs> now that would not allow that to happen. Um, but, uh, you, you know, 50s and 60s is a different era you know mm -hmm. um they used to hurt horses back then so but it's you know. it's incredible to see the size of that uh set you know or that stage mm -hmm. area it's beautiful the height of the ceilings mm -hmm. in the modern picture just what was that stuff they used to use for fog it was it b smoke the or... two-part smoke like an yeah. A and B smoke. Yeah. They yeah. said they actually used it in this because, okay. uh, again, the, the interview I was listening to, the actor, uh, Kuro Kubo, said, um, now you have all these newfangled machines that you just push buttons and smoke comes out. But back then, we had to mix it and run. Mm. <laughs> and I, I heard Man. it wasn't the, mo it was the most noxious stuff you could. Yeah. yeah this is, is this the it's stuff that to had your oil clothes? In it? Yeah. Yeah. I want to say this is probably that A. This is that AB smoke. Uh, okay. Yeah. 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 So uh <laughs> going through these. So that and there's some uh shots on set. So the the top picture is uh uh Kumi Mitsuno mm. sitting among the mushrooms partaking. Yeah. The uh with, the mushrooms some crew that, members around. the mushrooms that they ate were uh actually they had let me consult my notes here. Um, they had actually gone to the oldest uh, pastry shop in Tokyo, which happened to be right next to Toho Studios. It had been established in 1918. And they oh, wow. went to them and said, we need to make, uh, basically, we want something like mochi, but, you know, the, the dessert mm -hmm. mochi, but we don't mm -hmm. want it to be stringy. We want it to be kind of snap. And they would go to them every morning and they would get this base pastry that uh, the women at the pastry shop would make, they would take it back to the studio and press it into the mushroom molds. And then they would add sugar. Uh, apparently, Kumi Mizuno was very well liked on set. And so every time that she had to eat a mushroom, the effects crew would make sure that her mushrooms had sugar in them so uh -huh. that she would be like, oh, these are really delicious. <laughs> they ended up making so many mushrooms that a lot of the crew apparently used to eat them for lunch. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the way they painted them was with uh, straight food coloring, actually. Oh, yeah, okay. so, what a great story! That is so cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, really cool. So, and in the uh, center shot, we've got uh, Isaro Honda and uh, Akira, Akira Kuba. Kuba. Yeah, um, in the yeah. ship looking down the, the yeah. stairway so that you see mushrooms growing out of the wall. Know, and on the so, railing oh and, man. Yeah. Oh, you can feel it. Ah! <laughs> the smell. So good. Yes. So good. The sets are just also Ooh. so amazing. Uh, yeah. The uh, the set designer was uh, Kira Watanabe and Shigeru Kumatsuzaki. Apologies for screwing that up. Yeah. I'm sure I did. Um, the um, let's see here. What else do I got about these guys? The the gentleman that uh, Tezo. Toshimitsu, he actually did all the models and created the makeup. So wow. um, these three guys are pretty much responsible for the actual look of the wow. set 
and of the creatures themselves. Yeah. Okay. So who could you know who that is? Like so in this bottom picture, uh oh. we know it's Honda on the left. Ishiro and... Honda, the great man uh on mm -hmm. the left, creator of many of our childhood memories. And mm -hmm. uh the man on the far right is this A.G. Subaraya. Uh he was uh, affectionately known as the old man. Um <laughs> It lovingly, lovingly. Uh, and he, him and Honda, uh, Tomiyuka Tanaka, who was a producer, um, Akira Fukupe, who was a, uh, a, not the composer on this film, but those, those five guys just were so responsible for, if you're a kaiju fan, they, they're responsible for it. Mm -hmm. Um, they're just amazing. They, they were just such a talent at that time. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure yeah. who the three guys in the middle are. I apologize, but yeah, they are pouring over something, the script or, or uh, they're looking busy while the something. bosses are around. Yeah. yeah. If, I, if I look down, they won't tell me to do anything. Exactly. <laughs> I'm carrying this clapboard and walking around and making yeah. X's. <laughs> I, it's just, I, it's just cool to yeah, it is. see those. So, this is some of the makeup. This was the makeup on uh, the writer oh, character Hiroshi Tachikawa. And this is the one that you guys were talking about earlier that uh, uh, almost got the movie banned. Yeah. Uh, apparently, um, it reminded a lot of the Japanese audience of the horrors of Hiroshima, rightfully so. It, you mm -hmm. know, uh, but I'm going to guess knowing Ishiro Honda and his his uh desire to bring the hiroshima to the forefront of the world i can't help but think this is probably on purpose mm -hmm. um all of these were uh, latex at the at that point rubber latex was kind of a newer thing foam wasn't quite around yet foam prosthetics so all these pieces are all latex um as well as the matongo suits um mm. let's see what else uh, the prosthetics were basically limited to, uh, arms and faces. And a lot of the, like the bottom photo there, a lot of that is just scratch built. Uh, so they're not actually coming out of molds there. It's mm -hmm. like cotton and latex that you do when yeah. you're like trying to make a zombie when you're a kid. Build it's basically it the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love the transition. This, the slow kind of, um, like the top in the top photo here, it's just starting, mm -hmm. you know, when you just kind of see. Yeah. Uh, and then this, I just thought that that was really good to just a kind of transition of, of the characters, both like their personalities and, but then also like this transition of the makeup, it, you just kind of went along with it and mm. they did a really good job. This makeup yeah. is so awesome on his face. Yeah. It looks, it, it looks, you know, natural. I can see how it would be disturbing, especially during that time. Um, it reminds me of a before and after picture in a ten acting commercial. <laughs> exactly. Very Absolutely. natural. Absolutely. <laughs> that's that's where my mind goes. I'm sorry. Fast well, acting. What is what does this remind you of? <laughs> so this <laughs> my uncle Bill. <laughs> Bill. <laughs> like giant pustules or little mushrooms yeah. growing out or something, uh -huh. you know, that are uh, -huh. uh and that is just and that's kind of an early part of that, right? Yeah, that's um, the bottom character. Uh, that's uh, Mr. Amamato, uh, the guy that has the stuff all over his face. Actually, the top photo might be the same one. I'm not totally sure. Uh, but uh, yeah, Mr. Amamoto uh, was the guy that would wear the full pullover mask. Uh, they oh, okay. originally, um, the makeup was that was created by, and forgive my pronunciation, Taizo Toshimitsu, uh, who was also actually the, one of the, the main model makers in the original Godzilla. Uh, but he created all of the Matongo creature suits in 10 days, um, which is, yeah, which is quite of those. He did four, two, this is just what I have. I, my research is telling me uh, four, two piece suits and one, one piece suit. So that the one piece suit would mean the head is attached to the body and there's probably a zipper down the back that he would crawl inside of. Mm -hmm. um, each of the full suits was uh, about three meters tall, which is about 10 feet. And they weighed about 30 kilos, which is about 66 pounds a piece. Yeah. Yeah, definitely a sweater. Mm -hmm. Well, let's yeah. 
uh, so we also have this. Uh, uh, so yeah, and in the bottom, I mean, the, the bottom picture is uh, it's the Honda directing them, I guess. Mm -hmm. so, sure, it looks like that. Uh, this is sort of a front and back, and you said this was uh, on the way to lunch. <laughs> yeah, this is um, Mr. Amamoto. Uh, as he had gotten fully into makeup, and then they called lunch. And so he was like, I don't want my food brought to me. I'll walk to the, the canteen. And the middle shot is all the people seeing him for the first time. <laughs> um, if you look close in the bottom photo, you can see that it's actually a pullover makeup because they actually don't blend in the eye. You can see yeah. the edge of the mask around the eye. Uh -huh. You don't even care. It's just such, no. it's, yeah. it, it, it's could, so striking. And, you know, and especially in this time, you mm -hmm. never saw things that were just so uh, body horror, I guess mm -hmm. would be the best way to say it. Mm -hmm. What are yes. you having for lunch? Well, I was going to have the pizza, but now mm -hmm. I don't know. No mushrooms. Uh, and here's the uh, shots of the crew or uh, at the end. And I believe. Yeah, I can't read it now, but I think it was July 21st, 1963. That was the uh, wrap. Yeah. Um, according to my research, the, well, there's two things. The first thing is the top photo is a photo of the acting crew, which was under the leadership of Ishiro Honda. And the other side is Eiji Tsuburaya's effects crew. Uh, normally, okay. as we talked earlier uh, about the Godzilla things, the acting would be totally separate from the monsters, but in this instance, the monsters are life or human size, and so both crews got to work together. And apparently, they the a lot of the acting crew helped the effects artists set up stuff. Effects artists helped the acting crew setting up um, the set. So, uh, the interviews that I had listened to, the people were saying that this was one of the funnest sets to be on because ever there was so much communication. Mm -hmm. uh, with everybody on it and everybody felt that they were contributing to something that was noteworthy. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I would say is that and they were, were all eating mushrooms and they were all eating mushrooms or yeah. pastries <laughs> that look like mushrooms every day. Yes, yes. That's what I, but mean. the other thing that, uh, you were saying that this photo was taken in late July. Uh, my research shows uh, the movie came out August. Uh, I want to say 11th. That's just a couple of weeks. They were shooting this in sequence the entire time and they were editing it at the same time with this last shot being filmed only two weeks before release. So there's no time for pickups. It's, it's right, really right. being sure. Uh, it's also impressive that the composer was able to throw music on, you know, to, to these last few shots, only having a very limited amount of time to compose mm -hmm. something. Um, the composer well, actually... Also... Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No. Nope. Oh, I was just going to say the composer, uh, forgive my pronunciation, Sadao Beku. He, this was his only horror film score. Uh, mostly he did uh, crime dramas for Toho. Mm -hmm. I went and listened. I found the score on, um, on YouTube and I was really struck by one. It's a really good score. It, 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 it conveys the, the menace. It conveys the mystery and the horror and just i i think it just really adds to the atmosphere um but what i one of the things i thought was really neat about the score is that when i went and listened to it he had he incorporated the sounds of the ocean and he also mm. incorporated uh some of the matongo laughter into the mm. into mm. the music mm. just kind of not the <laughs> but more of the <laughs> little ones mm -hmm. in yeah, the back yeah. just as little punctuations you almost don't hear it mm -hmm. um but yeah, that was, mm, I, I, uh, that was my weird rabbit. Yeah, I liked <laughs> Well, I also liked how they uh, um, kept some of the, the, there were some scenes that were silent where there was no yeah. blocking music when it, and really built the tension. That, the uh, the whole score that I found is only 20 minutes long. Hmm. And hmm. you're looking hmm. at a, what, an 80, uh, 93 minute movie or so. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. lots of, lots of just letting it breathe, you know, mm -hmm. letting the silence well, was, be its own character. I was going to say, you know, when you described how the how quickly it came out and how they were editing right away and everything, and there was no pickup shots, that mm -hmm. that could be why there it feels like there's a couple of gaps in there that they either missed or maybe the shot didn't turn out and they didn't have time for uh, a you pickup know, for some reason. I, I I think that's a great point in that you, I don't know how much you're really watching dailies if you're literally because I. I would guess that Ishiro Honda would Piecing be involved with the editing. So he wouldn't be 
getting done with a full day of shooting, then go watch the dailies, then go edit. He's probably going straight into editing. So, hmm. you know, I could see how, like we were saying earlier about that guy just kind of disappearing, how that would be, you know, just something that was overlooked until it came out. And then we went, oops. Mm -hmm. So I've got a few shots from the movie that we'll try to get through uh, fairly quickly, but this is when they first discover, I mean, that mushroom in that crate, that was disgusting. God, <laughs> it was beautiful. And it oh, was, wow. Yeah, that could have been the whole poster beautiful. of the movie. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and, and written in script on the crate, Matango. You know, that's... In English, too, which I thought was strange. <laughs> yes, yes. And well. cursive. <laughs> we can't read this. What is yeah. <laughs> what does it say? <laughs> It's always nice to read the label after you open it and look at yeah. whatever it was, mm -hmm. you know. Always read the directions uh, last. Oh my god, this thing. Oh. Yes. Ooh. Ooh. That what? Jeng Jenga. Jenga. <laughs> Jenga. Yeah, don't pull out the wrong one. Huh? Oh Majenga. God. Majenga. <laughs> and I think isn't that when they were looking they just were out from the ship looking for stuff, you know. Those are <laughs> people is there anything <laughs> hey there he is <laughs> oh god like a mushroom well and that was that was another thing that was cool was how they made those you know when it was raining how they oh, made yeah. those mushrooms just yeah and they were growing yeah yes. that was oh, awesome that was uh, how rich and green that yes. is and wet there's and so wet. much texture and oh gosh so all those mushrooms were done uh the so let me get the gentleman's name uh teruyoshi nakano who was the assistant assistant director he actually went to uh a couple of local industries and said what have you got for me that's new and inventive and they said we're trying to come up with this stuff we're going to call it styrofoam and wow. at this point they had uh styrofoam was basically today in like effects we use rigid foam is that's basically what we call is rigid foam uh, it's a two-part chemical that you mix together, and within five, eh, maybe 20 seconds, it starts to rise. As it gets to the top of whatever you're mixing it in, it starts to mushroom out. So the director had about 15 guys all on the set, and then they would all have these little cans of the styrofoam, and they would mix it. When he'd say, okay, go, they'd all mix it, and then they would pour it into all these cans. Now, they discovered that a lot of the cans, the shapes of the cans would give them different size mushrooms and different mushroom tops. So oh. the type of cans that they ended up using cool. were uh, pineapple cans and uh, canned beef. <laughs> so those two apparently were the ones that worked oh the best. Oh my gosh, that so is so every, cool. Yeah, so everywhere you, everywhere you see a mushroom sprouting up, there's a can, like a beef can or a pineapple can, uh, with, and like 15 guys standing just off set throwing away their empty mix mix buckets yeah. and one, it's just chemically happening there while they're filming correct correct wow. um the one thing that okay as an effects artist as i'm watching this i the one thing that will upset your foam or upset any urethane uh which is what this is is water and yeah. to see the whole set being rained on as these mushrooms are coming up it, I wasn't sure if I was looking at a force perspective in that it's like a, a rain sheet that's just right in front of the camera and everything behind it is not actually being rained right. on. Or right. if this was just so early in the development of urethane, of the styrofoam, that rain just didn't stop it. It was just too hard. It sure looks pretty moist. <laughs> it's, it does look moist. It, and that I was the one. I couldn't it. find any information about how they got the foam to rise in being in such a wet environment, because as I said, water is the enemy of any urethane. But um, yeah, so that's how they, that's how they got all the mushrooms to rise. That's so um, cool. And just a side couple. note, um, this is the most times we've said moist. In moist, 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 moist. <laughs> there could be a drinking game here. Uh, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, Dallas, moist. are you listening? <laughs> uh, did you pick up on that? Um. <laughs> All right, uh, and this was uh, one of the characters walking through the mushroom jungle as they got bigger and bigger there, uh, just in the the fog and the wetness and the, mm -hmm. yeah, it's just... The moist. No, you took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> it's moistness. 
moist. Oh, the moist. <laughs> it was moist. Uh, and I believe she just enticed this guy into eating them. If I yep. remember right. That's right before mm -hmm. his hallucinations start with all the, the lights and then the dancing girls. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, fa I fast forward. I was going to ask you. I've been, you know, Chad. <laughs> musical <laughs> numbers. I, I just can't. I had do that it. down just... as a topic. Chad, did you fast forward through the song on the yacht and then and through the dancing number? Right? Both times. Both times. <laughs> she was pretty limber. I thought she was quite limber. Yeah. 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 Rather moist. <laughs> uh, let's see that's that's the one we just showed oh and that one uh that was the oh, thing God. there and that's got like fur and grass and moss on it <laughs> it's gorgeous Daphne's oh really, uh, wow so beautiful. no it's Squeamish amazing it. it's amazing i live in the pacific northwest and there's moss and moisture yeah. and ah! that word again oh god moist moist yeah. <laughs> Dirk pizza. <laughs> and the last shot we have here is hey. uh, yeah, that's good. When he makes his his uh, statement, I ate them. Mm -hmm. I have a date tonight. Does this look bad? <laughs> yeah, I, I I love the makeups in this. I love the homage to Hiroshima. Obviously, the one mm -hmm. thing that I would say is a draws my eye probably and this is probably just a professional thing is the no makeup around the eye itself yeah it's yeah. very much a circle mm -hmm. um that could be the type of makeup they were using at the time they didn't want to get it near the actor because it could have done damage to their eye right. or it right. could be the actor saying don't get that crap near my eye mm -hmm. um yeah. but uh it's definitely uh it's a very safe uh well and it uh, doesn't space. it's it's not you know it's one thing to sit here and look at the picture but it doesn't that long of a shot agreed yeah. agreed yeah, yeah. It and it's meant as a it. shock you know mm -hmm. he suddenly he's mm -hmm. talking he's got this monologue with his back to the camera and then he all of a sudden turns around and you see that and that's the shock cringe um did you guys notice that the entire cityscape that's in the window that's all a model yeah. I didn't notice, but yeah. I loved I loved that. I loved how they had all those lights and colors and modern society and stuff happening yeah. right outside these windows. Um, beautiful. It definitely beautiful. didn't. Yeah, it was beautiful. It had almost like a fantasy feel to it, or I, Very I thought much it was so. great, like an uncanny yeah, valley almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that was, Akira. and I just it was so different yeah. from the other. Yeah, stuff. very Akira. Yeah, mm. yeah. Yeah, so I've I had one other thing down here that I wanted to talk about, and that was the women characters. As I was watching this, I was thinking, "Wow, these are not this. This is definitely 1963." And I and I <laughs> I believe so. This is a another short story, but I was in a uh, university. Uh, I was in a class that we had to do team projects, and the people on my team, one of them was a guy from Japan. Uh, and his name was Koichi and a woman from Hong Kong who a lot of times would have Americanized names mm. um, that they use. And, and she went by Amelia and she came to me and said, this was in like uh, 2002. It's only like 20 years ago. She came to me and said, I take that back. Uh, it was probably 97, 96. Um, but anyway, she came to me and said, you have to do something about Koichi. He's, it's just typical, these Japanese men, they just don't pay any attention to the women and he just won't do anything I say and blah, 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 blah. And, and I'm thinking this was kind of back that up, even though this was like 30 years earlier. Uh, they were not, you know, the one woman, uh, Mommy, was a, a was mistress. Just basically a sex symbol that got... Mm -hmm got what she wanted by manipulating men. Um, and the other one was just, I don't know, so timid and like her big thing was to fall in love with the professor, which happens like that. Uh, they she should have had, had a said, crush on him for a long time. but They had said that they were actually lovers. Uh, Kira Kubo, who played the professor oh, okay. uh, in the interview, he had said that um, even though it wasn't specifically spoke about, that they were supposed to already have been... Okay a student teacher lover. I, I would definitely agree that they're the, the very stereotypical of the time, but Kubi Mizuno, 
I, I feel that she's a femme fatale. I feel that she's mm-hmm. there earlier. Okay. She's definitely uh, treated like a product as a mistress. You know, when the guy goes to grab her and says, I'm going to take her tonight and nobody says anything, you're kind of like, Ooh, that's, that's mm-hmm. as gross as the mushrooms. But um, when she gets to her, her power and she starts manipulating everyone else. And she, I, I, I found her to be uh, in charge. You know, I, mm-hmm. that's a good point. Um, it's, it's, uh, Kenji, uh, Sahara that has that line. Well, it sort of broke her out of the mold of how, uh, these women in these types of roles in these types mm-hmm. of movies are usually right, played. Right. You gave her a little bit more depth and, and, and a little bit of more insight on her character. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought the normal monster movie. Type well, so maybe, movie. maybe I just took it wrong. It was just him was being really misogynistic but he's like he says there's a reason for all this i know what it is these women they're on your mind all the time but you can't do anything about it that's what's wrong Mm -hmm. with everybody isn't it it gets me too it's really bugging me um yeah that was gross to hear Uh, (laughs) but uh, i feel like uh as far as like the characters i there were stereo i mean they were all stereotypes women were definitely stereotypes but um yeah i saw her definitely as a femme fatale and uh you know, you have certain way, certain, you have certain opportunities for power and you take sometimes what you have, what you got. And um, that's kind of how you use it and how you, that's the power that you have. And, but I felt like she, you know, she said what she thought and i think describing her as a femme fatale was was uh, mm-hmm. is is good for sure and i even though the student um you know was definitely that stereotypical kind of meek person i felt i really liked her character at the end she really kind of stuck it out even though there was you know definitely things about her that were meek i felt like there was some strength there but okay. the, yeah these are stereotypical character characters um, I do like Mimi or Mamie. Is it Mamie or Mommy? Mommy. I think it's Mommy. Mommy. Um, yeah. yeah, and I like that she was kind of involved, you know, involved at the end. It had this power at the end. Yeah. Yeah. But um, you know, it's like the the that quote that you had about blaming women for male bad behavior is just so present all the time that it's almost like you know, it's just there. And so it's, it's gross, but you know, as a, as I was talking with someone else about this and it's like um, watching these movies, uh, especially movies from the seventies when they came out and then watching them now, um, you know, it is kind of like, Whoa, this is wow. You know, but it's like, when you're a young woman, this is all you have to see pretty much Mm -hmm. was was this stuff Mm -hmm. and that Mm -hmm. and and the women being you know women not being allowed on a ship because the men won't be able to control themselves and it's going to drive them all nuts and this is that's the cause of all this you know it's it's like so so present that it's like if you want to watch movies if you want to well even if you don't want to if you're watching movies (laughs) that's that's how it is and um, me going back and watching it you know later um I almost feel, um, I don't know if this makes sense, and it's t- I, I wish Whitney had, would be here, but um, I feel like strong now watching these and like, yeah, I, I'm going to watch this. I'm watching from the beginning to the end, and I'm going to see what happens, and you're not going to take that away from me, and I'm going to look it straight in the eye, and you just do it, bring it, you know, and um, that happens a lot in like when we talk about stuff uh, more like in the seventies where it's like some of the like really intense rape scenes or mm. the really bad mm. misogyny. Um, mm. It's like when I was younger, I probably wouldn't have been able to watch it cause it was just, too, it was too real. And now even though it's real, I feel like, yeah, I'll watch it, but I'm going to, I'm going to watch the whole thing. And then yeah, yeah. that's it. You know, I watched it. I'm still here, whatever. But um, so that is a little bit, I, I like feeling that way. I like feeling able to watch something from the beginning to the end and not flinch or flinch, but still keep watching. So yeah. you kind of 
that's kind of a side, a long <coughs> side trip, but the, the discussion that of him saying, um, you know, what's these women, I was like, of course he's going to say that. That's what people say. You know, that's what, you know that's what, what weak that's men what, always say. That's what people, that's how it is, you know? So um, it well, is Well, they kind of started in that. on that women on the ship thing. You don't want women Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which yeah. we first heard that in King Kong, the original King Kong. Yes, yeah. we did. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well said. Uh, one thing I would say about the Kumi Mizuno character is she starts to attain her power well before she eats the mushroom um, mm -hmm. in that scene where the owner, the ship or the rich guy comes mm -hmm. in and is starting and he's seducing her. She, and when the other guy, the uh, Kenji Sahara comes in and they start to fight over her and she mm -hmm. just kind of stands back and watches it with mm -hmm. the smug mm -hmm. look like mm -hmm. she's in charge at that point. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. she's the object of all of their desire. She mm -hmm. knows it and to the mm -hmm. point where she goes out and tells the student, ha, I'm in, you know, they mm -hmm. want what I've they got. All right. yeah, they, they all want me. They all want me. Yeah. Right. And I'm in, right. I'm in power now. Right. And yeah. And did. sometimes that's the, that, that's the only option of power that you have, mm -hmm. you know? So it's um, maybe not something that, you know, we look at now and it's like, Oh, you know, she's just using her body, using whatever. It's like, you know, you only have certain things at certain times and, you know, she was very powerful and she spoke mm. her mind and she, you know, yeah, yeah, I think Femme Fatale is a really is a, a good character, uh, a good description of her character. Yeah, yeah. and well, culture I'm, and and um, culture, culture yeah. and the time mm -hmm. time, the time. Was mm -hmm. film, agreed. Yeah, you know mm -hmm. it has a lot to do with that too. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the so, mindset yeah. of those times right. is mm -hmm. a little yeah. archaic by today's standards. Yeah. Well, and that's something that I you know we talk about that a lot. Um, you know, watching at the time that it was filmed, and this movie, when I was kind of thinking about it and digesting it afterwards, I thought about that in lots of different ways. Like, what was it like to watch this movie at that time? Um, you know, it's just like from from a kind of body horror perspective, it's like. Ooh, the stuff that's happening to their bodies, you know, it's yeah. relatively new. And, you know, I imagine like being a horror lover watching this and just being like, whoa, we have the special effects. But I also think about it for um, Hiroshima and Nakasaki watching it and in the and the changing times with, you know, these more modern um, relationships, maybe or, or whatever. It's just I feel like there's so much going on in in this movie and i think it's it's really cool that honda i mean when you talk about godzilla and stuff you talk about how hiroshima affected him and you talk about you know all these kind of things that you see in this monster movie and that's also fun to watch but it's like he in this movie he you see it too and he told you know talks about these characters and and the breakdown of society and stuff like that and yeah it's a it, it's a monster movie but i just and, and the fact that's the way honda tells it and the excellent acting and just the attention to detail and the set design and the special effects it's like this is a really good movie and so i wonder what was it like watching that like in the theater or as it's being made at that time it just i i really wonder right. what it was like as I soon as Jeff's done with his time machine, we'll all know. Awesome. <laughs> right. Let's go. <laughs> right. Well, so, so here, I, and, and, and I'm not trying to be, uh, uh, I don't know. I can't think of the word, but anyway, I mean, I'm, I'm glad that you said all that, Daphne, because I'm just an old white guy trying <laughs> to, trying to understand and, uh, I don't know if I want to say sympathize or have some compassion and see it from that other side. Mm -hmm. And, I, I'm sometimes astounded by the stuff I watch now that I grew up watching as a kid, you know, mm -hmm. sitcoms in the fifties and sixties. Uh, and never thought a thing about it because mm -hmm. that's pretty much the way it was. Yeah. You know, it's mm -hmm. uh, so that's how anyway. we progress. Boys. <laughs> so that, that's why I, 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 I try. I try to see from the other viewpoint, but I know that I can't a lot of times. And one of the things I was thinking about with this movie was I don't have any idea. I can't even imagine what it's like to be uh, Japanese in that time period. You know, mm -hmm. what uh, mm -hmm. Godzilla was like eight, eight, nine years after mm -hmm. Hiroshima and Nagasaki that 
these, you know, tens and hundreds of thousands of people were killed and affected. And, and, uh, what, you know, how that, how that affects you and the way that you live and everything. I just, it's, mm -hmm. it's beyond my mm -hmm. understanding. Um, well, the original Gojira, uh, brought that to light beautifully. Absolutely. Um, and, and, mm -hmm. and portrayed what it was like, you know, remember the scene in the hospital mm -hmm. where the people are just yes. lined up in the hallways. Oh, yeah. um, it, it, so it gives you, I'm, we weren't there cause we'll, and we'll never mm -hmm. know, but it, it it's it, that, be, that movie I think best portrays um, that situation of, of mm -hmm. what it may have been like to live, live in that time. In uh, in talking to what you were saying about seeing it in different eyes, you know, it's I a lot of like Ishiro Han or movies that have a deeper message than when you first see it. Uh, this mm -hmm. kind of reminds me of like watching early Tex Avery cartoons, all the old Looney Tunes where mm -hmm. you watch it and you just enjoy it. You go back later and watch the same cartoon and you see all these adult messages that you never mm -hmm. saw when you were a kid. I think it's kind of the same thing with this film and mm -hmm. much of Ishiro's kaiju mm -hmm. work. Uh, mm -hmm. You go back later and you're like, oh, you start to put the pieces together of when the time was and what those people had been through. It would be a very different thing to sit with a Japanese audience at the time this came out mm -hmm. than with an American audience. You know, the mm -hmm. Americans wanted to see attack of the mushroom people and right. Matongo has, is a, is a deeper meaning, you know, mm -hmm. and I, and I don't think it would have been lost on it. Well, obviously it wasn't lost on the Japanese audience because they want Some people wanted to ban it because the mm -hmm. makeup was too familiar. So mm -hmm. it's, it's great entertainment, but it's got, as most of Honda's work has at that time, it's got this really mm -hmm. wonderful underlying message that's educational. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I don't know what else I'm going to say. So there you go. Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah ex exactly. That's exactly right. And I, I just we love that Honda awesome. did that. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good cover. Um. <laughs> So I want to, I, I, I did want to bring this up just because I don't know if anybody else watched it, but but we found uh, the the William Hope Hodgson story, The Voice in the Night, was done as an episode of a TV show in 1958 called Suspicion. It was a lot like an Alfred Hitchcock type show, and it, well, Suspicion was made by Alfred Hitchcock's production company, Shamley. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was, Shamley. It was uh, on the. I, I saw. It said Alfred Hitchcock's The Voice in the Night, but then when I saw the credits, it I, I could see that it was. Uh, uh, he was directly involved, but anyway, uh, the people that are the the version that's on YouTube, there may be one someplace else I couldn't find it, is really really hard to watch. Uh, it's very poor resolution and just sometimes so dark you can't see anything uh, because a lot of it takes place at night. But I, it's very close to the story as very. far as I could tell. Uh, and the thing that makes it really interesting to me as somebody of that time period is that the two people, you know, in the story, uh, it's, there's a, there's a, there's a ship with two guys on it. And then there are two people that you find out were shipwrecked on this Island. And the guy rose out to him and is talking to him. Well, the guy is James Donald, mm -hmm. uh, who's in Quaker mass in the pit mm -hmm. and Barbara Rush is in tons of stuff. I mean, if you look yeah. at her career, she's amazing. And then the two guys on the ship, the captain is Patrick McNee. McNee, yeah. His, and his hand is James Coburn. Yep. We're like going, what? <laughs> this is, you could once I knew that I could recognize the voices, but it's uh it's really interesting, I thought. Uh and you do you you can see once he gets into where he's telling the story about how his wife and he got shipwrecked, uh, and you're you're kind of getting the flashback during the daylight, then it's okay. But it's uh anyway, I, I think it's it's worth a watch slash listen, I guess. It's hard to see. Uh, anyway. Are you going to include th those links um, in the show notes? I sure can. Yep. Yeah, because I, I was going to watch that. I started watching it, and it was a little dark, and I thought, okay, well, I'm going to come back later and watch this. But I also I listened to the, um, the reading of the story, and that was really awesome. So I think... You know, it'd be great if other if people are interested, then they mm -hmm. can just check it out. Yeah, yeah, we will do that. Um, yeah, well, William Hodgson's really wrote some interesting horror. Um, 
Oh, actually, here, let me get this is how interesting he was. This is his book, uh, The Nightland. This is this oh, is yeah, a quick, yeah, yeah. This is a quick uh, that some author wrote about this. He <laughs> says, the Nightland is a tale of the remote future, billions of years after the death of the sun. It's one of the most potent pieces of macabre imagination ever written. There is a sense of cosmic alienage, breathless mystery, and terrified expectancy unrivaled in the whole range of literature. And the guy who wrote that was some guy named H.P. Uh, Lovecraft. <laughs> who? <laughs> some, some writer guy. I don't know. But well, uh, that, they never were, heard of him. He was a yeah, mm -hmm. never heard of him. At the same, they were writing around the same time. Like, yeah, uh, they were contemporaries, yeah. and Lovecraft was a huge fan of Hodgson's work, um, and considered him an equal in many, mm -hmm. many instances. Wow. Okay. Uh, I'm full apparently there was a story a few years later <laughs> called Fungus Isle uh, by somebody named Philip Fisher, but it was. The, at least the stuff I read about it, they they basically said we don't know how he got away with not getting charged with plagiarism or yeah or, yeah it's basically the same story yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway all righty uh, except anyway, that, I think it was weed people wasn't it something like that yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. The fungus yeah, yeah. the fungus among us the um, fungus among us <laughs> dun, 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 dun. so. Jazz hands. Last thoughts. Jazz hands. Uh, we're, we're running long. You know, whenever we have guest hosts, we always run long. But uh, I, I, I think it's always good discussion. I love the discussion. So, long. Any, any and final, final strong. thoughts? Anybody? That, anything that you wanted to say you didn't get a chance to say? Or I'm going to let someone else go before me because, of course, I have something to say. <laughs> anybody else? Anything to say? <laughs> Ask me. I. You guys check it out. It's it's so much fun and. Um, some folks might, you know, it might be a little slow, but um, it's worth it. And it's, it's got some awesome characters in it and the colors and you're going to love the uh, set dressing and the yacht is so gross <laughs> and um, it, it's so moist and, moist. Um, <laughs> and yeah, you gotta, you gotta see it. Yeah. And just think about how cool it is that um, the person who is gave it helped give us Godzilla made this movie. And um, yeah, it's yeah. you got to see it. Yeah, you can you can watch this movie and look at it as just a, a monster movie, like mm -hmm. another monster movie. Uh, or you can get into the deeper yeah. meaning yeah, of it yeah. like we did mm -hmm. tonight. Uh, it's just a great movie. And it's uh it's one of Honda's, I think it's one of his best movies um, mm -hmm. with the message that's in there and some of the things he was trying to say, but he was also uh, trying to entertain and he did both very well, I thought, uh, in this Agreed. film. So yeah, if you have not seen this, yeah, seek it out and don't, don't underestimate it and think it's mm -hmm. just like, it's just a, a kid's movie or, or something like that. It's, it's really a really good movie. And Absolutely. we kind of talked about all the different actors who have been in, who are in it, who've been in a bunch of other movies you might recognize. Mm -hmm. And if you love Kurosawa, I love Kurosawa. Um, you might recognize a character if you like Seven Samurai. Um, so just give it a watch it. Absolutely. Yeah, watch it. And it's watch moist. It. It's and very it's moist. moist. You know like Daphne uh, said, it's moist. Bring a towel. Nobody, yeah. nobody said it, but I thought didn't it look like there was like a different color of fungus growing in different rooms? On yeah. The yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's true. I think that there are different. Yeah. Now we know, we know one of I know I should have kept yeah. my mouth shut. Now I have to go check behind the refrigerator <laughs> after the show. <laughs> Uh, well, the, the only things that I would say in closing is I got a couple more, like just random trivia things about it. Okay. Uh, I'll make it quick. I apologize. Uh, one, the the laugh, the Matongo laugh at the end, the, rawr, 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 that they ended up reusing that later in the Ultraman series as one of the big bads, uh, Baltan. Mm. Uh, oh, if you know who that wow. is, yeah. that's his laugh that they recycled. So, yeah, that's actually oh, that's the Matongo. Cool. Um, as you know, Ishiro Honda had taken about a year off 
the film he had made prior to this was King Kong vs. Godzilla in uh, August 11th, 1962 is when that came out. Matango came out one year to the day later. Uh, after this, he went on and did Atragon and then Mothra vs. Godzilla. Um, I do feel that this film signifies a slight change in the Toho. Uh, with this coming out in 63, the following year in 64, both Oni Baba and Kwaiden came out. So oh, I, I kind of feel Excellent that movie. they had they were moving into more of a ghostly, you know, just less less giant monster. I mean, well, I don't want to say less giant monsters because the following year is like Mothra versus Godzilla and all. But I just feel that they had moved a little bit more into. Uh, I don't know if this is supernatural. I wouldn't say so, but I guess more Earth based, you know, mm -hmm. closer to the ground. Yeah. <laughs> um, what else do I got here? It was their um, moist era. It was their moist era, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, and, oh, one other thing. Uh, the filming locations, which were Oshima Island uh, and the other island, which I can't pronounce, I apologize. But I will just say this, that uh, apparently on the island, a lot of the crew had to deal with uh, poisonous Japanese copperheads and uh, giant centipedes, which <laughs> kind of sounds like its own movie on its own. Yeah, no, it does. <laughs> Uh, but the one really cool thing that Akira Kuba had said in an interview I watched is that he said that they had locals, uh, uh, the island locals would be around to catch the snakes to keep them from going and biting anyone in the cast and crew. But every time they would catch a snake, they would cut its head off and then drink its blood. And he said that everyone would just stop and watch these islanders just gawk, 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 and throw the snake away. And doesn't everybody do that? I try not to anymore. That's more of a youth thing, you know, like uh, a Friday night. But uh, yeah, I should have quit a long time ago. Uh, nobody likes quitters. <laughs> Except I'm gonna have to check out. Uh, I was trying to remember what uh, Toho movies we've done. I mean, in the '50s, we did Godzilla, Half Human, and Rodan. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the 60s, I'm not sure what all the ones we did are that. So now we've got uh, Matang Matango, and then uh, what, what was the one we did? Uh, the Frankenstein one, Chad? Frankenstein Conquers the World. Frankenstein, yeah. Yes, Frankenstein Conquers the World. Or the Japanese title is Frankenstein vs. Baragon. Yeah. Uh, okay. Sorry, I don't get out a lot. Um, <laughs> no, none of us good. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys do War of the Gargantuas yet? Speaking of uh, Kiro Kubo and no, Kumi I don't Mizumi. think we did that one. We just uh, did. We just did. Uh... No, yeah, we did. We did. We did do that. One more. Up. Uh, let me jump back because you're gonna have to stop me. Um, one uh, of the Matango suits was actually played by the great suit actor of all time. Oh Haru yes, Na Haru Nakajima. I'm glad you Godzilla. brought that up because I saw that and I was like. Wow. Yeah, he is. He's well, he's my hero. Uh, whenever I, I get to do suit work for uh, KMB every once in a while, every time I get a trailer, I have a photo of him coming out of his Godzilla suit. And I always give it the prey and say, please uh, give me your strength because that's so cool. he. Oh, my God. He, he, he passed away amazing. not not too long ago. Dude. He did. Right. Yeah, he did, right. unfortunately. But what a legacy. What a yeah. life. Um, one of his greatest things that one of his personal um, uh, just I don't even know what the word is, but one of the things that he would always do every time is not complain. He always would say whenever he was in a suit and it was really uncomfortable, like the Matongo suit, most likely he was in the one piece suit, you know, sweating his guts out. But mm -hmm. he would always look out and he would always see the rest of the crew out there and he would say, all these people are depending on me doing a good job. I will not fail. And mm. I don't care how hot I am. I don't care if the miniature truck explodes in my crotch like it did in Varan. I'm going to stay in character and I'm going to run this. I'm going to do the best that I can always. And I think that etiquette, that work etiquette is is exemplary. And it's something yeah. that I, as as a crew, as a suit guy, once every once in a while, I always try right, to right. remember that and 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 push that legacy, you know. It's a good ethic for anybody. I know? agree. Mm -hmm. No speak. That's what he yeah. used to say. <laughs> no speak. <laughs> so, oh, that's, anyway. that's excellent. I'm glad you brought that up because I yeah. had forgotten to. Um, well, we do have some feedback. Just, just a few. 
Not a lot. What did you think of the movie, Jeff? Oh, I loved it. I loved it. Um, yeah. I, I mean, geez, mushrooms. And it wasn't... Moisture. Moisture. It, moisture. it was... It, I'm telling you, the, the shit <laughs> covered in fungus and... Uh, <laughs> And uh, the the squishy footsteps just mm -hmm. creeped the hell out of me. I just was like, how can they walk around in that stuff? I'd be like going, <laughs> you know, it's like there'd be spores, the smell, the mustiness would just. Uh. Mm -hmm. It is anyway. interesting. It um, Before, we, again, you're going to have to stop me. Yeah, but yeah. it is interesting yeah. to see the Don't influence hurt. that this particular movie has had in pop culture. From video games like The Last of Us, uh, mm -hmm. where yeah. you know the basically the people are cordyceps, um, mm -hmm. mushroom people, um, to as Chad we were talking in the pre-show about, uh, there's a villain that's in, called Matongo in uh, later Swamp Thing issues. Mm -hmm. um, it's and the toy lines and everything else, like it's it, for such a, a seemingly quiet movie, it seems to have a large mm -hmm. footprint in the horror genre. And yeah. again, as Jeff, you had said earlier, we were talking about Creepshow and its influences with the Jordy Verrill story, um, as well as even the Creepshow TV series, the very first episode with the, the Stephen King, the blue fungus yes, guy. Yes, yes. Very similar. It's almost the same story. Yeah. So, okay, yeah. that's it. I'll stop now. Well, I, and something else I was thinking of from the notes, I think, Jeff, you put that um, uh, Del Toro, Guillermo Del Toro, like said that he liked this movie, which I, I can see because he has done such a good job having like the the dark and the the he has he puts it sometimes like the the terrible and the beautiful or the horrible yeah. and beautiful together. And um I feel like Honda you know really really did that here and kind of I don't know. He it, it, it's just a really and I can see how yeah. this influence a lot of people. Um, and he managed to make it, it scary, even though it yeah. was beautiful to look Agreed. at. These, exactly. These, Absolutely. Make it scary. Exactly. Absolutely. And I find yeah. that so. Fa I love that. I, I I find that so fascinating. And and I love when when artists can do that. And I and I love how, for me, when we talk about Honda, I think about how this. It makes me think about how artists have these experiences and it becomes them and then part of them are is in what they create. And mm -hmm. so this uh, horrible thing that happened in the war became part of who he is and he creates with that. Yes. And yeah. so he he makes these things. He touch his bit touches these things. And um, I just and I love that that then translates into this movie as well as. Godzilla and mm -hmm. and um, I mean his Godzilla of course is, is so wonderful but that this is something that he would do and he would do so well too and um, I just I just think that that's really cool yeah. I, I love that I love that that happens with horror you know it's yeah. like that's yeah. why I will um, always proudly stand up when someone's talking bad about horror because it's like you don't know what you're talking about it's, it's, there's, it's, yeah. it's a lot of she does her mouth like that too when she tells people <laughs> you know, you know, you know, she she <laughs> she's poking him in the chest and then it. i push my glasses up closer to my yeah. head and then i do it again well you can handle a lot of subjects in horror thinly veiled for the powers that be you know that mm -hmm. they don't they don't yeah. you know and get those layers yeah. across like chad mm -hmm. was talking about right. And then also, um, it's it's also just a great monster movie, so you don't have agreed. to. You don't have to. You don't have to even think about that stuff. Just enjoy. You it. can go in as deep as you want. You can yeah. right. love it mm -hmm. as a monster film, or you can mm -hmm. read all the subtext under. Yeah. Um, well, it's that's, so cool. That's that the, the beauty of his films. Mm -hmm. I mean, the giant, and I don't. I didn't have a good picture of that except what was on the posters. But the 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 man size Matangos with the big mushroom head on it. Mm -hmm. But the thing that really made those weird, or or creepy was the extra like mushroom heads on the mushroom head or something yeah. i don't know i don't even yeah. know what they were mm -hmm. but it was just and then the the scene where one of them's chase him and they it uh sticks his arm through the hole in the door and he yeah. whacks mm -hmm. at it and his arm just falls off like mm -hmm. like like a branch very much a, like mm -hmm. the original uh thing from another world mm -hmm. the the mm -hmm. grass or the plant man or whatever right james right. arness so mm -hmm. yeah. um 
you're you're not exactly sure what's going on or what they're made mm -hmm. of or anything, but that just mm -hmm. adds like a oh, that's another piece of information that mm -hmm. they are really losing their humanity. Yeah, they yeah. don't even bleed anymore. <laughs> so all right, let's do this feedback so we can Okay. All right. Uh Chad needs his beauty <laughs> suit. He really does. He, he thank needs you. It badly. I thank you. You don't you don't need it. You look good. <laughs> Uh, well, let's go with Chad first. This one's for episode 130, the Bava film, Kill, Baby, Kill, from Mikey Z. Okay. Kill, Baby, Kill. Mikey Z says, never saw this prior to the DOH announcement of it being an upcoming episode. Great film. This is a female-driven film, from the Countess to Ruth, Monica, Nadine, and especially Melissa. This film puts the male characters in the back seat. Great performances by all the, these characters. I was surprised to learn that Melissa was not portrayed by a little girl, but a boy. Creepy kids, no matter what gender, are still creepy kids. Mm -hmm. And they need to die. <laughs> <laughs> Each shot is painting. Each shot is a painting. The chase scene between the rooms was expertly timed and edited. I love this film. As much as I love Black Sunday and Black Sabbath, I think I found my new favorite, Baba. Saw this with yeah. the Italian language release with subtitles. Much better than the English spoken version. Minor differences in the spoken soundtrack. But for me, more enjoyable. Great podcast by the crew. Wish Whitney were there to provide her insights on the, this masterpiece. You guys are classic. Thank you, Mikey. We beat a classic. Yo. Yo. Uh, <laughs> took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> Mikey. Um, let's see. Uh, who wants to do Dirk? You want to read one? I don't have them in front of me. So, oh, okay. Okay. I'm going to have to listen. All right. Uh, I'll just Daphne, add then. commentary. I'll do, I'll do <laughs> Son of Dracula. Okay. Episode 132, Son of Dracula, also from Mikey Z. This was some um, Dracula, Son of Dracula trivia that we missed. J. Edward Bromberg was the Al Alcalde in Mark of Zorro. Uh, I did see that. And Louise Albritton, um, the evil sister, was in Abbott Costello movie, Who Done It, with her natural blonde hair, mm. which I don't know if I would recognize her or not. So mm. I'll have to check that out. Uh, Daphne, you want to go ahead and take the next two? Sure. <laughs> For the fly. Maybe someone can help me. Yes. <laughs> um, the Fly, episode 133. Villamina Van Bottle. Science has done it at the quantum. Yep. Very good. We were okay. talking about that. Transporters. Mm -hmm. Very gay. good. Mm -hmm. And then uh, go ahead with Evil Genius. Okay. Evil Genius, you devilish gas hugger is now my favorite Shakespearean insult. <laughs> That's a good one. My dad used to call me that all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Gas yeah. hugger? Mm -hmm. Gas hugger. Yeah. There's a band from Seattle in the 90s. They might still be around called Gas Huffer. That's what I thought of when I saw Gas Hugger. The devilish gas hugger. <laughs> I, I totally agree this movie is a classic, and I do prefer this over the remake. I do love Cronenberg, especially Videodrome. But the original has more gravitas, very similar to Herbert Marshall's circumstance with his leg and the care taken to film his James Doohan Scotty from Star Trek lost his middle finger during action in D-Day in World War II. I forgot. I should have put a comma in there Okay. <laughs> uh, with his leg and the care to film him. And the Herbal care taken Mark. to film him, right? James Doohan from Star Trek lost his right middle finger during action in D Day in World War II. He was filmed to conceal the missing finger. The final scene with Fly, the final scene with the Fly with the human head, always reminded me of the dog with the human head in the '78 invasion of the Body Snatchers. Both scenes still freak me out. Me too, especially that one from the invasion of the Body Snatchers. So good. Mm. Yeah, freaky. They're freaky. Freaky. All right. Appreciate the feedback. Everybody, please uh, subscribe, like, make comments uh, on our uh, on the Grissom Magazine YouTube channel. Um, 
Tell your friends. That's it for this episode. But every two weeks, we'll be focusing on a specific film release between 1920 and 1969. And while Whitney's going to be gone for a few more episodes, so we've got some guest hosts. Right now, next up is scheduled for Dave Dreher. Woo! And he, an OG horror news radio goose amazing guy. And uh, he chose The Return of Dracula. Ooh. which we've talked about several times. He's always brought that up. And we finally, we found a streaming version we can use. Um, and then the one after that is going to be Hammer's The Brides of Dracula. Oh. And right now we're planning on having Dick Clemenson, the uh, owner-publisher of The Little Shop of Horrors. Cool. Magazine. And Alistair Hughes join us for that. We're a little bit uh, subject to Dick's schedule in putting out his new book, uh, which is Bitches and Banshees, the British AIP films. So, um, that's so Dick. It is. It is. That's very so Dick. For him, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want to. We we may swap those episodes, but the next two episodes will be the Return of Dracula and the Brides of Dracula, which is perfect for Halloween, right? Yeah. absolutely yes yeah this will be coming out in what mid-october or at least uh, in the month of october this episode here will be out like uh what is today like october 9th i think happy halloween everybody <laughs> Wee! yeah um let me think <laughs> nine and five no october 8th <laughs> or october yeah anyway i don't know mushrooms don't are good me. man I yeah, don't make me think man. on the fly. Uh, <laughs> the flashbacks are wicked. Uh, you see in this? Time? All right. Anyway. <laughs> so please, please send feedback. Chicken? We love the feedback. All I right. I see the chicken dog. My <laughs> hat just. I'm sorry. Just, this... We'll keep Go going. Ahead, you got to stop us. <laughs> <laughs> Stop, the size of that shit. Stop me before I pun again. <laughs> yeah. Catch us again here in two weeks for another great horror movie of the classic era, as only decades of horror can do it. And Dirk, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. My so pleasure. Much, man. Thank you. Uh, I, I just Yay. honored to be how here. I thank can you pay you back, so much. Uh, you are now part of the family. Yay. I love it. I could never stump the saint, so I'm, f I'm glad to finally be in part of the group. You know, like feels good. Feels it good. It was tough. It was tough. It was really tough. Yeah, you did an awesome. interview with Doc once, didn't you, or something? I did in the but in the very that. early in the in the okay. show. Yeah, okay. the era of uh, Vixen and Thomas. Oh yeah, yeah, and of course, yeah. and of course the Santos. Mm -hmm. But and this, yep. uh, if you, I, I've been seeing a lot of stuff pop in pop up in my uh, memories on Facebook. This was uh, yeah. five years ago this weekend uh, that he Ooh, passed, and we were at Wee Havoc Movie Festival. <clears throat> and I was when I heard about it, so yeah. it was well, nice hey. being around family. So since uh, since we're we're speaking of the the Black Saint and his most honorable run on this show, um, why don't I ask you guys a piece of trivia regarding Matongo and see if any of you? Oh, well, <laughs> well, we can't do we can't do stump the saint. Uh, Doc for a while was calling it stump the schmucks, but I don't want to. I don't want to throw that that moniker on you guys. So I'll just say I'll 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 take that moniker. <laughs> what's the I name don't of know the if boat? I put that on Daphne. Oh, what's, what's the name, name of the boat? Oh, the um, boat in Matongo. What's the hmm. name of it? I didn't know. The albatross? Well, I oh my god, you got it. Did I you get it? it? You got yeah! it. <laughs> Tell her what she won, Dirk. You've won. won moist. You've you've won a moist mushroom. You've I, won a box yeah, of I moist. moist. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> no, no hidden meaning there, the albatross. Nay, nay, my friends. This is a PG cast. The uh kind of moist. <laughs> I'm impressed. I'm really impressed. That was amazing. Good for you, Daphne. That was you. hell yeah. yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. See, I can't. I can't, right. I, can't awesome. I can't stop Daphne. I. Oh, I, <laughs> oh you can stop me. I'm just. Gonna... I just don't worry. You can stop me. 
That kind of sounds like say good night, everybody. Thing. Good night. <laughs> good night. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye bye. <laughs>